Um, so, as um, Burish said, this is not going forward. So, um, the uh, gene for the forest disease was identified, uh, well, now, 11 years ago. So, it was the 7th of January uh, 2005 that. Uh, that uh, the, uh, we were finally allowed to announce it because it was reported in science, which meant there was a, the, all the embargo, uh, etc., uh, involved with that. Um, and uh, the dog here uh, that we've had the picture of is showing, showing wearing doggles. And the reason why they wear doggles sometimes, if they tolerate them, that is, is because this is one of the photosensitive epilepsies, which means that flashing. Or, uh, suddenly coming into a bright light can induce the myoclonic jerks. And the, the hallmark of the disease, as Burge said, is jerks, myoclonic jerks, which feel like an electric shock going through you. And, and we humans, all, all of us, everybody around this table, I can guarantee you has had myoclonus, uh, because you can get this normally. And the two normal types of myoclonus that you can get is a hiccup, <laughs> which is a myoclonic jerk of your diaphragm. And one that the, the Laforest dogs get a lot, and that is a hypnic jerk. And you know when you're falling asleep, you're falling asleep, suddenly you're going like that. And you think, what did that happen? And, and I remember reading an article, and it said that this was an evolutionary advantage, uh, advance in humans that was to stop us falling out the trees when we were monkeys. <laughs> and I thought... I'm not sure I believe that, <laughs> but anyway, that's a hypnic jerk, but that's a, a cardinal feature of, uh, of the disease as well. And so what owners will report is the dogs will have these shuddering jerks, as this um, affected dog um, does. As you see, he's not got the sound because of the noise that nurses were making, actually, every time I did that. So I would just be clapping my hands. And every time I clap my hands, the dog judders, this violent juddering backwards. You see, he's walking about doing his business, and as soon as I clap, he has, has no, no choice. It's a complete reflex myoclonus, which means that it happens in response to the sound and flashing light. Now, you can see how disabling that is um, for that chap, because someone's only got to bang a door, um, or make a sudden yell, and suddenly he's thrown backwards. And it's uh, an irony that this disease affects uh, both dachshunds and basset hounds. Um, maybe maybe they're uh, a coincidence, maybe there's something back there um, uh, long ago, although uh, I don't believe that they had any connection back again. But the irony is that bo both breeds have short legs. And the problem with that is that their short legs, they're closer to the ground. And so uh, what owners report to me is that things, simple things like walking through long grass, walking through leaves and the leaves kicking up is completely disabling because the, the uh, movement, the other thing that stimulates it is movement in the dog's visual field. So when I first saw this, I was a vet in practice. And I honestly thought that the dog... Um, had become fearful, was head shy, because the owner, was, the owner presented the dog to me and said, every time I go towards the dog's face, it judders backwards. And I went towards the dog's face and it judded backwards. Um, and I, to be honest, I had no idea what I was, what I was seeing uh, at that time. Uh, and of course, flashing light is the other thing that can do it. So television, for example, is seen as a flashing light for dogs. Uh, and the other thing which is absolutely classic is you know as you're driving along the road and trees are there or tall buildings, the light flashes in your car. I mean, uh, there's a bit in the A3 that I drive down every day is, and it always flashes just as I go past the speed camera. And I'm always like, oh, did I get caught speeding? But, um, but it's, and, and which can make travelling in cars one of the biggest problems. So imagine the situation that you have an affected dog, you take them to the park, how do you get them to the park? Uh, even blinds on the car windows only limit that to a certain extent. 
And this uh, uh, piece here, you can see the bright pink. Oh, of course, the mouse doesn't work. Um, you can see the bright pink, um, which is some uh, examples of Lephora bodies. The breeds affected, um, uh, by far the most common one that, that I see is the uh, miniature warhead dachshund. The Basset Hound, I reckon, goes under the radar a lot. Uh, the last Basset Hound I saw, the owner sourced me um, because she read the symptoms of euphoria on the internet, uh, which is, you know, Dr. Google is sometimes a bad thing, but in many uh, ways this is a source of information. That dog had had a complete workup by a very prestigious um, university, shall we say, um, and had been diagnosed with idiopathic epilepsy rather than the forest disease. Um, so when you say that, um, uh, that vets aren't aware, even some neurologists will, will miss that. The other breed uh, is the beagle, and I would say I have never seen a beagle with it. Um, uh, we, we see beagles with idiopathic epilepsy uh, quite frequently. Um, but uh, I'd be interested to know whether the lines in the UK for the beagle are different to the other parts of Europe. Um, I suspect they are, uh, because colleagues in Germany, Switzerland, um, and the Scandinavian countries see, see uh, beagles. Uh, we've also had reports from be uh, beagles affected in uh, South Africa. And as Birch says, there's a potential for any breed of dog to have this. And I think it's worthwhile testing uh, in any elderly dog that, um, I think elderly, um, over, um, sort of over six years of age that comes in with this type of jerking. Uh, because uh, Birch did diagnose it for me somewhere. We haven't found those records yet. Uh, but I'm sure he diagnosed it in a Yorkshire Terrier that I saw many, many years ago. Um, so it is, is, it a, is, is it a thing that's out there. Now, um, the classics of signs of the disease, I should say that, that um, one of the peculiarities of this particular disease, which is a storage disease, um, and that means to say that abnormal um, or, or a byproduct of cellular metabolism gets stored in the cells and damages it. There are many storage diseases that we see in dogs, um, and, but, and they have, are, are, can be very similar to diseases that we see in humans. But generally, the presentation in the dog is at a comparable age to the presentation in a human. So, for example, with um, uh, juvenile Batten's disease, neuronal ceroidal lipofusinosis, which is a, a, a common storage disease in dogs, the juvenile form of that you will see in young children, age less than 10, um, and you'll see in young dogs, often from when they are um, before a year of age. The difference between the forest disease and, uh, and those is that um, the forest diseases are quite a late onset disease occurring from, from really from six, seven, eight years of age which is actually a similar age to when it starts to affect, uh, affect humans, which is interesting because it means it's one thing and thinks that maybe it just takes this long for the Lephora bodies to get big enough to cause their effect. I mean, Birch can um, probably elaborate on that uh, a great deal more. But this is the danger of this disease because the dogs up here completely normal and they can have successive litters without the breeder being in, at all aware, which means it's a dangerous disease for the breeding community because unless you have a way of testing for it or, uh, and are aware, it can become a high level within a breed quite quickly if you just unfortunately have a popular sire um, who happens to be a carrier for it. And as Berger said, it's a spontaneous mutation that could happen uh, to any breed. So the early phase of the disease is characterized by these myoclonic jerks, which are photosynthesis uh, sensitive ones, sudden noise and movement, and a, a manifestation of how irritable the cortex is. They can also have seizures, uh, which are usually generalized tonic-clonic seizures, so the, the full epileptic seizures. 
As a disease progresses, a very consistent feature is that the owners describe panic attacks. And after speaking to Bursch and his experiences with, with uh, affected people, we think these dogs also suffer from visual hallucinations. So uh, the first time I came across this was an, uh, an owner who said that every time she took her dog to, for a walk, the dog just panicked. And by panic she meant actually went, uh, acted like she was extremely frightened and bolted. Now at first I, I thought that this was um, a, a part of dementia. But it's so consistent that these, the dogs are acting like they've seen something and that they're extremely frightened. And by bolting, I mean disappeared. Imagine how frightening that is for the owner as well. To the point that m many owners who have dogs who are affected by this can no longer walk their dogs off the leash because they're so scared of what's going to happen. The dogs have an increasing dementia um, uh, that is characterized most importantly by anxiety. Um, so dementia in dogs is something we're only really learning about and we have dogs that have uh, Alzheimer type sim uh, symptoms but th th the anxiety part of it is, is a big feature. Um, they can become incontinent. Um, uh, so uh, this may be, uh, when we have dogs become incontinent in the house, we often say they are disinhibited. So I find it interesting that uh, Berger say that they have a disinhibited uh, senility, so, because of course our dogs are very well trained, they would not urinate in the house. The fact that they are happy to urinate in the house suggests they're disinhibited. They get a progressive retinal damage, we think, uh, as well as possibly uh, a brain blindness, a cortical blindness, a, a progressive visual loss. They seem to become deaf, although we haven't tested them electrically for that. They have increasing walking difficulty, which the owners describe as, as uh, stiffness. Um, um, but uh, I'm going to show you a little bit more about, um, about that later. If you were to do some tests on them at this stage, um, this is a dachshund I saw this week, and it's imaging elsewhere, and this sh shows a cortical atrophy. Already near the beginning. Of and this is quite interesting because the last, uh, because we often don't MRI them at this stage because it's a very expensive test, not all our owners are insured, or even if they are insured, they may not want to spend their insurance on that. Uh, and we do a blood test. So if we see the dogs from other neurologists, they often have had uh, an MRI. And I was quite shocked at the degree of, of cortical atrophy uh, in, in this dog. So uh, many of you will not be aware of what that looks like. So this is the cerebral cortex here. And this is the cerebellum. And this is the brain stem. And this is the spinal cord coming down here. And this is if we've cut the dog straight down the middle. Um, so the nose is there and the neck is, is there and this is the mouth here. And the important feature that you can see there is there's a lot of white. And the reason why there's a lot of white is there is a lot of fluid. So this dog has big fluid filled spaces in their brain. Um, now you could perhaps suggest that the reason why this dog has big fluid filled ventricles is that it might have hydrocephalus fluid on the brain. Except that's not the case because we can also see that there is a lot of white around the brain. So the brain floats in this cerebral spinal fluid um, and that reduces its weight. So the human brain, for example, weighs about a kilogram. And when it floats in the cerebral spinal fluid, it weighs about 100 grams. And if humans didn't have that, we wouldn't be able to stand upright. So this fluid is produced in here, it flows out here. So if it was blocked because of hydrocephalus here, then what we would find is that the brain will be expanded out like a great big balloon, like I've blown up the, the, the brain with fluid. But we can see that the brain is still very, very much wrinkly here. Uh, and the reason for the, the fact that there's so much fluid, that these big spaces here are so wide, is that the brain has been lost. Nature abhors a vacuum. Um, so if you lost grey matter, and in this dog's case also white matter, then you will, um, you, the, 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 fate, the space will be filled with fluid. And this bit here is the occipital cortex, so it's here. And uh, I found it quite interesting that the occipital cortex was the most severe affected area in the dog. And this is perhaps not surprising 
because the occipital cortex is the bit that receives information about vision. Uh, and of course, a lot of these dogs might clonus and their seizures are driven from visual stimuli, uh, light and, um, uh, 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 and whatnot. And this is also the temporal lobe here, which is involved with, with um, hearing. So these dogs get progressive loss of their brain substance, and I have to say this is a more severe, severe case. Um, and uh, eventually, I may have to switch the sound off because I'm probably talking during this. This is Daisy, Daisy Deadly. She's nearly blind. With this very high stepping. I would say cerebellar gait. Oops. Hang on, I'm just going to switch my sound off. It was supposed to be off. Because I usually just talk to the owners whilst, <laughs> whilst filming um, with, with the camera down there. So um, I have no idea what I'm going to say. <laughs> Here's Daisy. She's just wandering around. You can see how jerky she is. And how much difficulty she has in walking about, even. You can see the jerking there. And here's Bertie. Bertie is her son. And notice his head wobble. And unfortunately, Daisy had bred Bertie long before she developed signs of the forest. And Mrs. Debley was faced with the knowledge that she knew Bertie was become, going to become affected because she had him genetically tested when. If you look at her there, can you see her jerk? Mm -hmm. and Bertie's about three years younger, so he's less severe affected. You can see this tremor. And you can see Bertie had this, he, the bag dropped, and you see his head go backwards there. And that's his head going backwards, as I'm, I'm, that dreamy's bag is very crinkly. So it's, uh, and you see she has great difficulty locating and picking up, feel the biscuits around her, and she just cannot locate it and pick it up. There's this combination of visual loss, difficulty moving and controlling her head movements, and the jerks when she tries to do something. So she's locating it by sound there. So that's the late, how the disease progresses. Um, its management. Um, we, we spent some time looking at diet, um, high protein, low simple carbohydrate diet. I mean, we, we do say put the dogs on this, but the evidence that it makes a huge difference is, is not is, is not really there. Uh, it may make, not make things worse, but the, the simple fact is the brain uses glucose for metabolism. Um, we've, people have also tried to give medium chain triglycerides, which things like coconut oil, which dogs often don't like, um, because this is a direct food for the brain. And again, there is, there is not much evidence to say this is an effective prevent, certainly didn't prevent Bertie developing it. The myoclonus uh, is treated with a, a human, second generation, anti-epileptic drug, levetiracetam, and to try and avoid the triggers. So um, uh, one of the first cases I came across was this little old lady with Parkinson's disease. She was very lonely. Um, as vets, we felt like we were one of her only contacts, and she got rid of her television set when the dog was affected. And I just felt that was just so sad. Um, get rid of one of the only contacts she had with her outside world. The levetiracetam only uh, will help very much initially, 
Um, but it's, its duration of effect will wear off. It will become less effective as time goes on. And then if they develop seizures, then they can even have our traditional drugs of phenobarbital and bromide, but the adverse effects of those drugs can sometimes be not so good for these dogs because those drugs cause a lot of sedation. So we often do use um, uh, what's really a third generation uh, human anti-epileptic drug called sonizamide, but it is horrendously expensive, being several hundred pounds a month. Uh, so often not what, uh, what people can use. And that's uh, really all I wanted to say as a very brief overview of the d disease in dogs. <laughs>